You can't talk about the Mevlevi tradition and some other Sufi traditions without talking about the role of dance. Some, some uh, lines from Rumi's poetry. The dance of the beloved. Dancing in ecstasy you go. Dance when you're broken open. Dance if you've torn the bandage off. Dance in the middle of the fighting. Dance in your blood. Dance when you're perfectly free. Tell us about the just critically important role of dance uh, in the Mevlevi tradition and others. You know, it's a, it's a very interesting thing because uh, Islam, there's an orthodoxy that I grew up seeing where music is not really a part of the tradition. Dance is certainly not a part of the tradition uh, because of their association with more secular activities, I think is what it was. And for some, they felt that it, the word is the most important thing. And they felt that activities such as dance or music make people deviate from their beliefs. But the truth is that, you know, just like there are people who are cerebral, cerebral in their learning and people who are visual in their learning, uh, I feel that the same exists for faith, that some people find faith through movement or through playing, through that resonation, you know, the resonance of vibration, uh, as opposed to just the cerebral word. Uh, because, in essence, you can say the word over and over, but if you're not understanding what's being said, then it's not really working, you know, to an extent. Uh, movement, from what I understand and have read, too, with the Sufi orders, uh, with Rumi especially, really began as his outlet or his expression for the loss of his uh, mentor and teacher, Shams din Tabrizi, and almost to the extent that he did not know what else to do but to spin. Uh, which for me, I can understand that wholeheartedly. Like, you could either take that anguish, that anger, and let it out and make it, you lose your faith, or you find a way to channel it. And literally, they channel it in this faith. When you put one right hand to the sky, and you bring your left hand down, you are literally becoming a conduit to the divine to receive and to spread and give to others around you. Uh, I personally can't think of any greater symbolism than that. And if you want to call that dance, if you want to call that movement, the fact is, what other more natural way to have that occur than to create a spiral, which is why they're spinning and not getting dizzy and falling down because, it's, yes, it's a physical technique, but it's also a state of mind. This entrancement that you go into, it's beautiful in the same way that you might see a Hubble telescope image of galaxies in a spiral. I mean, spirals are life. And I think that's what it is, is we're embodying as human beings in this movement of dance to receive and to transmit the spiral of life, the spiral of the divine, whatever it might be. That's at least my interpretation of it. Um, Others might look at it as something different. Some have seen it as just performance. But the truth is, even in performance, whether it's a ceremony or whether it's a concert, for me, it's always going to be a spiritual practice. Um, I don't play music because I want to see the reaction on people's faces. I play it because it's, to me, a spiritual practice. Uh, I would not have chosen it otherwise or found it to be my vocation because um, it certainly wasn't the money. <laughs> um, it was really, to, it, it was the value, and I guess that, that's a whole other subject, is it makes you question what is value. Yeah. And, and to me, value is not some kind of currency symbol. Value, as a common denominator, is that which makes you happy, what you can do, but also can be something contributed to, to others and to humanity. What is your contribution to humanity? But related to the dance, um, we actually, as many religions, especially Abrahamic religions, um, it's a patriarchal religion, uh, or has come to be practiced as such, shall I say. Because, ironically, the beginning of Islam was really almost, in some ways, uh, a way to organize how the genders treated each other. There were a lot of rights afforded to women in Islam through the Prophet, that 
um, go unnoticed sometimes. Because at that time, again, we have to be careful viewing history with modern lenses. Uh, but at that time, they may not have had... But his first wife, Khadija, was uh, a merchant. She was a businesswoman, 20 years his, you know, his senior. Uh, just for that to happen, one must put themselves into a, a framework to realize how would that happen? You know, how do we view that in today's society? But how was it so acceptable for a, a prophet, no less, to, to have that kind of sensibility? And obviously, you know, people can spin stories any which way that they want. But the fact that that happened, and the reason I bring that up, is that over time it went from being this kind of respectful towards, you know, a respectful religion towards women to eventually people's interpretations as many patriarchal religions would have. Judaism has the same thing. Christianity has many of the same rules. Uh, I think that today we're breaking out of that. And, for example, in Sufism, traditionally many of the people who were spinning were men. Uh, they would wear the conical hats, which served as basically what you might look at today as extra antennas <laughs> to receive this message. And they would wear what ostensibly looked like dresses um, and spin around. And those dresses would become kind of a spiral, as a beautiful shape. And uh, it wasn't until maybe the last five, six years that I started to see uh, an emergence of female Sufi dancers as well. Um, one that was from New York, and I asked her, and she said, I learned from my father. I said, wow, this is pretty amazing, and she's American. Uh, there was another that I met in um, uh, California with the same, same story. And there was another woman in New York who established an entire school of spinning. And I was very fortunate uh, in working with the Jirahi Order in Chicago to run into um, a dancer. Her name is Elizabeth Adler. And she has a dance company, Chicago Dance Theater Ensemble in Chicago. But I would see her, all the, I would see her at all of these interfaith functions and all the Jirahi. I said, I, are you Sufi? And I, she said, actually, yeah, that's kind of my pathway into this. I said, I'm so glad that I could see you and, and not make an assumption that you were or you were not. It's very unassuming. She said they were one of the few groups, especially the order in Chicago, she said that just opened their arms and accepted me. She said, they said, and this is her words, they said, uh, oh, you're an artist? <laughs> just come on, come on in. Uh, I think they understand, they see the beauty in art, whatever art you practice. And they understand that to practice an art requires a spiritual devotion. That's, I mean, it is a spiritual practice, even if it's in front of people or not. And so I'm very happy to say that uh, I spoke to her and we were able to put together a program that not only will pay respect to the tradition uh, of Sufism, but will also take us beyond that. Because I think what we need to do, if people want to bring the next generations to the faith, whatever the faith might be, we're going to need to devise new ways for them to understand it. Because if it's going to be this tradition, they're just going to feel like they're wiping off dust from old relics. Whereas they can actually be seeing this and reinterpreting it in a new way. And the truth is for me, you know, all religions aside, the first true reconciliation that needs to happen, I think, in the world is the reconciliation of genders. When that happens, I think we'll find a little bit more balance in the world. Thank you.